How vulnerable are our cities in the 21st century as they rapidly grow in size and complexity? And how do local and national governments anticipate the stresses and dangers to their economies, infrastructure and citizens? Resilient City designs strategies and solutions on a massive scale to future-proof the world's conurbations against the potential threats of climate change, poor land management and communication gaps. I'm here in Davos to speak to Resilient City founder, Dr. Alexander Mirescu. Alexander, great to talk to you. Let's start with the problem before we talk about what you do. Sure. How vulnerable are our cities nowadays and, and how much is that vulnerability increasing as urbanization increases? Uh, firstly, it's great to be here with you uh, today, Andrew. Uh, the short answer is that cities are experience high levels of exposure, vulnerability uh, and risk. And this is not uh, getting any better. That risk is increasing. It's increasing because of a host, a complex uh, set of risk drivers, including urbanization, poor land use management, knowledge gaps in government. So as we continue now into deeper into the 21st century, we're going to see more and more problems with cities. Uh, cities are growing rapidly. To give you a little bit of sense, by mid-century, uh, according to the United Nations and some other international organizations, seven of 10 humans will live in an urban center. That's a tremendous amount of stress and pressure on an urban system. So if we don't start to uh, remodel our cities and rethink the way we design cities, uh, we're going to experience a lot of economic and, and other types of disruptions. So there's two things there. There's cities that are already built and there's cities that have got the chance to kind of get it right first time. But as far as your work's concerned, how does Resilient City start to assess or diagnose the needs of a particular conurbation? Well, we depart from the stance that you cannot reduce your risk until you know what the risks are. And for that, you need uh, really detailed evaluations of an urban system. So we developed, uh, going back to 2016, a methodology of uh, using some indicators. And there are, in fact, several other out there. But in general, we developed a system called ResMap, a resilience mapping tool, that gives us a, uh, an overview of where some of the weaknesses, where the vulnerabilities, the exposures, and the hazards are for a city. And once we get that overview, we can start to pinpoint what types of interventions, risk reduction interventions that we can start to take. It's all complex, but give us an example of, of, of a vulnerability a city might have. The biggest vulnerability that, city has, that cities have today uh, is clearly water. Uh, it's a principle that I call the 80-80 principle. Uh, approximately 80% of, of world cities currently, they don't have proper stormwater management systems, they don't know how to mitigate for floods, Effectively, cities are in conflict with water, and they have yet to redefine or define themselves as, as being in this tensious relationship with, with water. I suppose one of the problems a city might have is all the different layers of governance that there are responsible for different patchwork areas of the city as a whole. And so who is it who would get in touch with you? Who is it who would decide what we need here is outside help, a big picture to look at the problem? We get contacted from all different sides. Um, in more developed uh, states, cities in, in developed uh, countries, uh, we can sometimes work with offices of sustainability. That's a, a typical focal point. But of course, the largest risk driver for us is the lack of political will. But we see that changing. And therefore, when we uh, are contacted by a mayor or a councillor or another municipal institution that has that political will, we work with them directly as well. And presumably the more stakeholders that get together to talk with you, the better. Resilience always has to be an inclusive process. It needs to uh, be multi-sectoral. Uh, it's never just one singular area. So it can include and typically does include uh, something as micro level as neighborhood associations and uh, chambers of commerce to even something as simple as uh, public works. If you want to find out where a city floods the most, go to the garbage collectors. The people who collect the rubbish, they know exactly where, where those problems lie. So if I'm a particular city authority and I identify some issues that we think need to be dealt with, why come to you? Firstly, Resilient City, we've been extremely successful at creating really innovative uh, partnerships with specific firms uh, across the whole disaster landscape. 
what does that mean? It means that we, as Resilient City, we come to the table with a whole host of partners that can solve problems. The second part of that response is, uh, why would a city come to us? Well, resilience is just good business at this point. Uh, for every one US dollar that's invested in resilience, that equates to between seven to 10 for response, recovery, and, and reconstruction. That is just good business. Resilience is a good business model simply because if you're looking on your ROI and your return uh, on investment, uh, show me any public sector or private sector stakeholder who would like to pay seven, eight, nine times more on their investment. So at this point, cities need to become more adapted, they need to become more resilient, because it's in their interest as, as a business model. This is where cities become more attractive. And also, presumably, there's lessons learned. So you work on one city, you can take those lessons to other locations and people can benefit from that shared knowledge or that shared experience. That's true. On the one hand, we're always committed to tailoring our, our evaluations and tailor, tailoring our action plans. But of course, uh, there are a lot of shared risk and shared exposure and, and shared hazards. So uh, like I said, you know, water is one of the biggest things, especially flooding. Uh, and it's happening in places you would never think that, that floods. Uh, so you were telling me earlier that you worked in the Middle East. Who would ever think that the city of Doha uh, in Qatar, floods regularly, or c cities like uh, Jeddah, you know, the, the economic and trade and commercial sector of Saudi Arabia, experiences horrific flooding, uh, horrific in the sense that the city shuts down and all economic activity goes with that. And therefore, you know, whether we're working in supporting a project in the Middle East or one in Mexico or in the United States, we are starting to see similarities and that helps us in our business model because we can always draw from successful cases. And in terms of the transition that we're all going through and expected to continue in the 21st century, partly because of cities getting bigger and partly because of our climate throwing up more surprises, mm. uh, how do you see this developing over time? Well, I see it ultimately as becoming the, the new imperative. Um, cities will literally fail or begin to fail. It will be almost like a business model. Good cities, cities that become sustainable, cities that move towards greater climate adaptation, that adopt uh, resilient mechanisms, those are going to be the cities that succeed because they're going to be more attractive for business, they're going to be more attractive for housing, uh, they're going to be more, much more attractive for real estate development and smart real estate development or a concept that we work on called resilient real estate. And therefore, uh, it will become almost like a competition over you know, the, rest of, the rest of this century. What do you say to a mayor out there somewhere on the planet who's thinking, I know that infrastructure is a bit shaky, I know that there are some issues with, uh, with water runoff and things are changing a bit, but oh, I think I'm just going to wait till the next mayor comes before I deal with the problem because it's just too much to deal with at the moment. What's your message to a mayor who's got that kind of dilemma? My message is rather direct. Whereas 10 years ago we would have said, well, you know, we'd, we'd like to do like some, a test case or a pilot project. We are way beyond that. The technologies that are out there for stormwater management, for flood mitigation, for green infrastructure are long past the pilot project stage. They are now cost effective, if not cheaper, than, than current engineering models. In fact, that's one of the risk drivers that we indicate in, in our ResMap model. Uh, traditional engineering, just if we keep building in the same manner, using the same technologies, we're going to continually, essentially, build risk. Uh, and so we have to look at what are the technologies that, that, that are out there. And we have very successfully brought small and medium-sized enterprises that never thought they were in the resilience business. We've been quite successful in partnering with them and bringing them to the resilience market and showing mayors to say, look, this civil engineering firm does some really interesting stuff and it's not going to cost you any more. It might even cost you less. Alexander, pleasure talking to you. Thanks very much. Thank you.